Good morning. Welcome to Woodlawn Without Walls Worship. On this Sunday, September 24th, we are glad that you are here. On behalf of Pastor Lance and myself, we want to welcome you to this worship service. Pastor Lance will be joining us later in the service, bringing us our message this week. Here at Woodlawn, we're committed to maintaining this online service for two reasons. We want this service to be available to folks who are unable to attend in person, and we also offer this service as an introduction and an invitation to those who might be interested in learning a little bit more about who we are here at Woodlawn as a community of faith and grace. If you're interested in finding out a little bit more about Woodlawn, you can find that information on our website, woodlawnumc.net. One of the things that is in the very DNA of Woodlawn is our focus on missions and missional giving. Did you know that each Sunday, Woodlawn has a moment for mission, a particular mission that we designate our giving towards? If you're interested in what this month's, or this, excuse me, this week's Moment for Mission is, or how you might be able to give, you can find that information on the website by clicking on the Giving tab. As we come together this morning, we prepare our hearts for worship by joining together in our call to worship. Would you read these words with me? They're on your screen. There is nothing in all creation that is more powerful than you, O God. We are reminded that nothing is greater, nothing is more mighty than our God. For you, God, are defender of the weak, the poor, the widow, and the orphan. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We worship a mighty God. Hallelujah. We 
we come together now in a time of prayer. I'd like to offer up a special prayer written by Pastor Lynn Scloser. This is a prayer focusing on justice and justice ministries. Would you please be in an attitude of prayer as I lift up this pastoral prayer? We'll close our time together by reciting the Lord's Prayer. Please pray with me. You who was, who is, and who will be. We settle into these comfortable, time-worn ruts, ruts of weariness, busyness, good deeds, contenting ourselves with what is. And yet, God, your quiet voice sings out insistently in our dayscapes and night dreams of a world where justice prevails, agitating, thrumming, calling, conjuring notions of what could be. It's ourselves we're up against. These ruts feel good, feel known, addicted to the narcoticized ease, enough of weariness, busyness, good deeds, clinging to what was. It will take who you are to remind us whose we are. Awaken within us the raging need for a new song so that perverseness of heart may be so far from us that we finally leave the ruts behind and sing to you of a justice that will be. We lift this up in your name, holy God, as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Little David defeated the giant Goliath with nothing more than a staff, a sling, and a handful of stones. That's the story we like to tell, that we like to, to sing about. But we've been learning these past couple of weeks that it was David's faith that made all the difference on the battlefield. It was faith that helped David conquer first the giant of fear within, and then faith led David out to conquer the giant warrior Goliath. But how do we tackle some of the giants that we battle as systems, as structures of injustice? What, what do we do when the, when the problem seems so large and so complex that we can't even figure out where to start? I'm talking about giant problems that we often face that we finally just accept as a part of our world because we believe nothing can be done about it. Things like violence and homelessness, a burdensome health delivery system, an ineffective criminal justice system, or racism, or access to mental health care, just to name a few examples. You know, the really big, giant problems out there. It isn't like David battling Goliath, but David battling a battalion of Goliaths, or better yet, invisible Goliaths, where we don't even know where to aim our sling. Fortunately, David and Goliath isn't the only story of doing battle with giants in the Bible. We have another example of a Bible hero that we don't talk about nearly as often as we talk about David, who takes on an entire structure of injustice and oppression. And like David, 
He is a man of deep abiding faith. His name is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was an officer in the Persian king's court during the time of exile when the Jews had been carried off to Babylonia. He was a cupbearer for the king of Persia during the time of the exile. The Persians eventually allowed the Jews to return to Jerusalem, and when they arrive, they find their city and their temple is in ruins. And it's Nehemiah who returns and is appointed the governor of Judah under Persian rule and convinces the people and the priests to begin rebuilding the city walls. And as they do so, some of Judah's old enemies, the Samaritans and other groups that benefited from Jerusalem's collapse, they begin to deride the Jewish people and contend with them. Nehemiah is a pious man whose faith in God continues to motivate him and others to rebuild the walls nonetheless. And the walls go up and the enemies of Judah really aren't anything more than a nuisance. But that's not, that's not the full story. You see, something else became a much bigger threat than even Judah's enemies. It's a system of injustice, a system of loaning money and charging interest and taking pledges of slavery when people are not able to repay their debts. You see, some of the wealthy within the Jewish community resettling in Jerusalem were loaning money and charging interest and taking slaves from their fellow Jews, something they had learned to do from their Gentile enemies. At the beginning of chapter 5 in the book of Nehemiah, the situation has become so bad that it threatens to bring halt to the construction of the Jerusalem wall. And it threatens the well-being of the entire community. Not only were people giving their sons and daughters as a pledge against their debts, they were taking out mortgages on their land in order to pay their taxes and even to purchase food during a time of famine. Nehemiah finally decides the only way to bring this corrupt and unjust system on its head would be to call all the people together in a large assembly. I'm going to read the passage from Nehemiah 5, the first 12 verses. Now there was a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish kin. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters, we are many. We must get grain so that we may eat and stay alive. There were also those who said, We're having to pledge our fields, our vineyards, and our houses in order to get grain during the famine. And there were those who said, We're having to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our kindred, our children are the same as their children, and yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have been ravished, and we are powerless, and our fields and our vineyards now belong to others. Nehemiah said, I was very angry when I heard their outcry and their complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials, and I said to them, You are all taking interest from your own people. And I called a great assembly to deal with them. And I said to them, As far as we were able, we have brought back our Jewish kindred who have been sold to other nations, but now you are selling your own kin who must then be bought back by us. They were silent and they could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us stop taking interest. 
Restore to them this very day their fields, their vineyards, their olive orchards, and their houses, and the interest on money, grain, wine, and oil that you have been exacting from them. And then they said, We will restore everything and demand nothing more from them. We will do as you say. And I called the priests and made them take an oath to do as they had promised. After the assembly, the unjust and predatory lending practices stop and the people begin to work together. And they are now able to afford not only the royal Persian tax, but they can begin to fund again the construction project and eventually they finish it. You see, felling this, this unjust system, this giant, it didn't just benefit those that owed money. It benefited the entire community. One could argue that the Jewish faith itself was saved when the assembly came together to demand justice. I want to go through just the highlights of the story. It starts when Nehemiah hears the outcry of the people and becomes aware, convinced that there is a problem and it makes him angry. And he takes some time to think things over, meaning he takes time to analyze the problem and identify who the responsible parties are and determine what might be an appropriate solution, what could be done about it. And then what does he do? He calls together a large assembly, a public meeting. He's not going to make his demands behind closed doors, nor will he do so alone. He's going to stand with all of the people and call out the nobles and the rulers and those who not only benefited from this unjust system, but those who had the power to do something about it. He states the problem and he states the solution, which he had thought about. Remember, he had reasoned it out ahead of time. And facing the, the large assembly of people who had been wronged, what do the noble and the rulers do? Well, they acquiesce. They stop their practices and promise that they will restore everything that has been taken. And when this happens, it benefits the entire community. The money no longer taken in interest, no longer being used to redeem their enslaved offspring, is now used to redeem mortgages and feed the people and contribute to the rebuilding of the city wall. See, by faith, the giant is felled and all the people prosper. Now, I tell this story because this very story from the Bible is being used as a model across the country by communities of faith who are addressing similar giants in their own backyard. Complex structures and systems of inequality or injustice that benefit the few at the expense of the vulnerable. It's a model that is in its beginning stages right now in Sedgwick County. It begins with faith leaders who gather from all over the community who become aware that there are problems right here in our community. And then it continues with an opportunity for people to share their stories so that the outcry of the people might be heard. And that's the part of the process that we're, uh, we're facilitating today in our worship center for any who would like to participate. The telling of stories helps the community assemble and select two priorities that they identify as the giant problems in their own community. Then there's a period of discernment, thinking it over. The problem is better defined. 
it is researched, its causes, its roots. Solutions are researched as well. Ideas from other communities that have battled similar giants is heard. And finally, there is the Nehemiah assembly. Just like in the story from the Bible, it's even called the Nehemiah assembly. Faith leaders stand with a whole assembly of the faithful. Here in Sedgwick County, we're hoping that that assembly will be 2,000 people, perhaps even 3,000 strong. And it's the assembly that calls those who have power and authority to do something about the problem that they have named to make decisions and commit resources toward the solution. One of the more recent times that this has happened is just up the road in Douglas County. In Douglas County, 112 small groups were organized with over 1,400 people to connect around shared values and stories. They asked one another the question that we are asking today in our tabletop groups. What is it that keeps you up at night? What are the anxieties? What is, what is it that keeps you up worrying? In Lawrence, when they asked this question, one story emerged over and over again. Regardless of geography or income or race or gender, the story most often heard was that of people in the community that are suffering from mental illness but could not find adequate treatment. Research revealed the problem was even worse than the people imagined at first. Police reported that in an average eight-hour shift, the Lawrence Police Department was handling eight mental health calls every eight-hour shift. There was an eight-week lag time for psychiatric consultation. The emergency room at the hospital and the jail were both overrun with people suffering from mental health crises because there was no place else for them to go. The Social Justice Initiative in Lawrence named themselves Justice Matters, and they began to work on a solution. They learned about a mental health center in San Antonio where people could simply walk in just like you would do at an emergency room or where they could be taken by law enforcement for a suite of treatment services rather than booking them into jail. A vision emerged that a similar place could be built in Lawrence. It would be the first of its kind in the state. People of faith from throughout Douglas County then came together. They assembled, numbered in the thousands, and they pressed elected officials for expanded mental health treatment in their community. Eventually, a referendum was put on the ballot and 71% of the voters in the county decided to dedicate a quarter of a penny sales tax to mental health treatment. And the new crisis center was built. The result? Emergency room losses were reduced by over $4 million a year in that community by diverting 50% of all the emergency room visits to the new crisis center. And there was a reduction in jail bookings during that same period. Jail bookings fell by 52%, which meant that a new jail facility that was being planned wouldn't have to be built after all. And that saved taxpayers some $154 million. This all happened because faith communities of God's people came together. They assembled to tackle the giant problems in their community. Similar stories have happened in Johnson and Wyandotte counties. They're underway presently in Lincoln, Nebraska, because of the Great Plains Conference of the United Methodist Church that has provided some seed money for this work. Each community choosing their own priority, what the big scary giant is in their local community, that needs to be tackled. For example, in the Kansas City, Kansas area, the giants were gun violence and affordable housing. In Topeka, the giants were public transportation 
and the success of school children in public schools in that community. In Lincoln, it is being identified as criminal justice reform and mental health care access. What will be the giant that we slay in Sedgwick County? Well, that's yet to be determined. It begins with listening. It begins with listening to the stories of the people, asking, what is it that keeps you up at night, that keeps you worrying? How has it affected people that you love, your family, your friends? And then listening and recording how persons are deeply impacted and affected by common concerns within our community. Now, everyone who participates will then be invited to join this justice network, and they'll be invited to hear the short list of priorities that were discerned out of the listening events and be given an opportunity to vote on the top two that they believe are worth fighting, the giants worth slaying in our community by communities of faith, led by a mighty God that is bigger than any of our giants. Assembled people of faith calling for justice. It's happening. And we're going to be a part of it. And then we'll be able to say that we are fulfilling God's commission that is voiced by the prophet Micah. We're not only walking humbly with our God, we're not only loving mercy, we are doing justice as well. And the giants had better get out of our way. Thanks be to God. Go with this blessing today. The great giants are no match for our God. And God's people, when we work together, felling the giants with God's help. Thanks be to God. Amen.